so a little bit ago, I did a video on my uh, Pacific 201 Romulan vessel, and I thought, why not do the Pacific now? So the Pacific, um, this is the result of many months of design and modeling and redesign and remodeling and uh, eventually coming up with this. And a driving force behind this design was to make something that wasn't designed to look cool. I designed the Pacific to look like a real space vehicle. You know, visible greeblies, recognizable technology, stuff like that that really helped it connect with us. So things you'll notice right away are like, you know, the sensor pallets, the dish, the radiator panels here. And of course, these are radiator panels, not solar panels. Uh, these are these are lifted right off the International Space Station as a as a part of a thermal control system. Heat is a huge issue in space. Your ship can very quickly become an oven if you don't deal with the heat of all the technology that you're using. So you'll see um, some evidence of thermal control systems on the ship, like these uh, ridges on these panels here uh, is supposed to indicate a radiator system. Uh, the ridges over the warp coils here. And in the back here, this is supposed to be a thermal control system for the warp plasma conduits coming up from engineering, which is in here. Now this whole engineering section um, slides out like a drawer and I'll put a picture up there to illustrate what I mean. And this is kind of based on an idea from Doug Drexler, who designed the NX-01 Enterprise. He envisioned engineering being its own removable module, and I thought that was a really cool idea. In fact, modularity was a big idea behind a lot of the Pacific. So if we get really up close and personal with... Oops. We get really up close and personal with the nacelles here, we actually see that these are coupled. There's, there's these little coupling... Uh, joints here with the idea being the nacelles can be jettisoned so we have modular nacelles and I also designed the bridge module to be completely removable as well so you see where it connects to this kind of spine corridor there's this flexible gangway that is supposed to be able to uh, retract and then the the bridge module becomes its own independent spacecraft so there's lots of little bits like that. And I'll post a picture of uh, the Pacific completely disassociating all of its modules. This is a good chance to get up close and personal with the uh, the bridge module. You see a lot of a lot of greeblies, which is not common for Star Trek, but again, I wanted to really ground the look of the ship. So we have handrails for spacewalks. And we have some details like these dishes are lifted right off the Hubble Space Telescope. These periscopes are lifted right off the Soyuz. So there's actually space technology that we're familiar with on the Pacific. And of course, I wanted to give it a really strong sense of being inhabited by people. For instance, there's an escape hatch on top of the bridge module. Going over here, we see a little bit more of that naval influence on the Pacific. These are missile hatches like you would see on a destroyer. And uh, it's, I guess, a controversial addition, but I, I did this based on uh, Spock's line in Balance of Terror that the Romulan War was fought with primarily atomic weapons. And um, I thought maybe during the Romulan War, Starfleet was strapped for photon torpedoes, or you know, antimatter was too valuable just to shoot at enemy ships if other things could be used to destroy them just as effectively. So I used the term hyperatomic missiles. Now, it's, it's nonsense, but I still wanted to use the word atomic to uh, you know, communicate that idea and kind of link it to canon in that way. Moving over, we see windows that look into the Arboretum. There are no trees in there right now, unfortunately, but there's an identical set of windows on the other side here. Now, lots of people have asked about the fact that there's no USS in front of Pacific. And my, my thought behind that is USS is the designation for Federation ships that have cooperative multi-species crews. So it's not just, oh, now the Federation is founded and every single ship is now USS something or other. So the implication behind this is that the Pacific is 100% human crew. That doesn't mean that there's not a USS ship out there in the Pacific 201 timeframe, but the Pacific itself is not a USS. It is an Earth Starfleet ship with an all human crew. So it's just Starship Pacific. Here we see a reaction control thruster block. Um, I really wanted to have individual nozzles. 
Here we see more of these greeblies. This detail here is a tractor beam emitter. And I, I textured it with a car headlight, but uh, it's, it's a tractor beam. And if we swing around to the back, there's another one in the back for guiding shuttles into the bay. And uh, let's take a look at the bay now that we're looking at it. These uh, lights here I kind of lifted from an aircraft carrier. Let's see if we can get in here through the window. Ignore the uh, bad texture work here. Um, the shuttle bay is something that I spent a lot of time designing, and it, it's kind of based on the uh, the fighter launch system in Space Battleship Yamato, where the, the fighters are all kind of stored in this carousel. And it's a really amazing use of space, and the it shows how that a relatively small cylindrical space can hold a lot of spacecraft. And I thought, in Star Trek, we have so much inefficient use of space because we design starships as though they were buildings. In spacecraft, I think we would use space a lot more effectively. So each of these bays holds a shuttlecraft, and we can hold four around the carousel. And this whole thing can rotate, and the shuttles can come out, and you know, you can hold two shuttles here, you can hold the shuttle down below. So you can actually hold seven shuttles in this shuttle bay, um, even though it's actually a really small shuttle bay in terms of Star Trek sizing. And there's a uh, Enterprise style, an NX-01 style drop bay on the bottom. These, hey, there's actually a little shuttle on there. I kind of forgot there was. But there's a, a drop bay here, so the shuttles can launch downward through the carousel, or they can be pulled out into this, this bay, and this door opens, and they can launch out backwards as well. The Pacific's deflector dish is, of course, a callback to the original series navigational deflector. But I thought that that solid copper look of the original series kind of was a little cartoony almost. So I wanted to make it feel more like real technology. So I, I had the idea to just have the metallic color around the edge and have everything else just white paneling. And you get the, the you evoke the feeling of the TOS style navigational deflector, but it feels more like real tech. Here we have a photon torpedo launcher. Nothing, nothing too amazing about that. There's an identical one in the back. And the idea is that these share common ammunition through the middle that would be loaded in, uh, uh, in magazines. Here's one of our observation galleries. It's, it's pretty under detail, but, um, it was important to me to put the lights in there. So that when we kind of look at it from underneath, we, we get a, it's kind of like fluorescent tubes. There is actually a little door in there too, but uh, we don't, we're never going to get that close. There's an observation gallery on top as well. And people have confused this for some kind of a bridge. Uh, it is based on the like flying bridges as they're called on a, on a naval vessel, like a navigation bridge. But it's actually more in, in the case of the Pacific, it's more of an observation point for a, uh, for manual monitoring of the nacelles um, because up here is actually a secondary engineering section because we have the uh, warp plasmas piped up through here and out through here and there's a there's a second section up here where there's a lot of engineering functions. Let's take a look at the nacelles. The nacelles really reflect my feeling of making everything feel like real tech. Um, I, I kind of started with the original series nacelles but I wanted to make them feel more mature and more realistic. I didn't want them to look like this one homogenous tube. I wanted to feel like this was technology that was real and robust. You know, everyone notices that there's no glowing Bussard domes here. And that's a very conscious decision. Um, because again, like I said with the navigational deflector, I didn't want this to feel cartoony. Um, so there's no, these are completely covered with panels. And people say it looks like the JJ Enterprise because they see this blue. This is not part of the Bussard Collector. It's it's all in this dome as it would be in the original series Enterprise. Now, under certain lighting conditions, this band here is somewhat transparent. Just a tiny bit, I guess, translucent. And you can see a little bit of like the red coloring in there. But only under certain lighting conditions. I wanted there to be animated elements to the warp nacelles. So I added these panels that these actually expand, they open up. And you can see, you know, there's kind of evidence that the, they would shut. So at warp, these open up. I just thought that was a, a cool look and it's probably something heat related. So this is where the uh, the warp plasma is piped into the nacelle. Here, and here is the plasma injector and then these are the warp coils. Let's take a look at the back of the nacelles. Of course, we have the ball 
that is seen on the original series, the back of the nacelles in the original series. But I, I wanted to make this a little more colorful and interesting, so I added the blue lighting. Let's take a look at the impulse engines. I kind of glossed over those. Most Star Trek ships have red impulse engines, but in Star Trek Enterprise, the impulse engines are blue. And in Star Trek Enterprise as well, we see the starship Defiant in, in Amir Darkly. And so I made them blue because that's there's the most canonical defense for blue impulse engines for this era. And I, I made them circular rather than the squares we're used to because I wanted them to feel, again, more like our technology. It just visually has more of that rocket feel that kind of connects it to, to us more. These these hatches here are deuterium batteries. Let's just take a little look at the edge of the saucer. We have the sensor pallet, some windows with overhead lighting. These are just equipment bays. And of course, we already got an up-close look at this. These are forward sensors. I call these antennas whiskers. And I just thought, you know, when you're far away from the ship, you really, lo you really lose it. You know, the ship just has this, you know, the circular saucer feel and everything. But I wanted the ship to kind of look different at different, you know, when you got close to it. Adding these little whiskers seemed like the perfect little addition there where when you get really close, it's like, oh, it's not all just perfectly smooth. But these are probably retractable. You see similar details on the back of the nacelles, too. And I kind of actually wanted to put those whiskers all the way around the circumference of the saucer, but it was a little too much, so I just kept them on the front. So that's the Starship Pacific. I've spent hundreds of hours working on this and thinking about everything that's under the hood, as it were. So if you have any questions about the Pacific, I'd love to answer them. Even if I haven't come up with an answer, your questions might uh, help me fill out some of the gaps. Let me know if you liked the video so I can look into making more of this kind of stuff. I've got tons of 3D models that I could explore. Not all just Star Trek. Some of it's my original sci-fi stuff, too. If you want to support my work, my ongoing internet endeavors, check me out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. Thanks for liking and commenting. And uh, I'll see you next time.